Well, thank you for listening to another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Fields. Well, I'm not your host. I'm doing an intro. Show Barack is going to be your host today, but I'm just doing an intro um, to thank you for tuning in. This is a special episode. If you have been following the Jew 3 Project, you know about our Courageous Conversation series to bridge the gap between African American voices that are in a more mainline um, seminary arena and those are in a more conservative evangelical um, arena. So we have today um, Show Baraka, which is moderating for us. Welcome, Show. Thank you for having me, Lisa. I appreciate it. Um, and Dr. Vincent Baco. Welcome, Dr. Baco. Hello. And Dr. Marvin McMichael. Am I and I'm, am I pronouncing it right, Dr. McMichael? You are indeed. Thank you very much. Yes, and delighted to be here. Okay. <laughs> and so this episode is not only sponsored by the G3 Project, but our friends at um, Jame Jame Yee. So thank you for partnering with us, Jame Yee, and show is going to take it from here. All right. Well, thank you, Lisa, for having me. I am. It is my pleasure and my honor to even be among such scholarly individuals. I will give a slight introduction um, and then we will go on to the questions for I understand we have limited time. So first I would like to introduce to those viewing uh, Dr. Vincent Baco who is an associate professor of theology and director of the Center of Applied uh, Christian Ethics at Wheaton College. He has uh, written numerous books but one book in particular is uh, Politic, uh, The Political Disciple uh, theology of Public Life. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Baco. Um, and then we also have Dr. Marvin McMichael, who is a Chicagoan. Uh, every <laughs> he who has probably forgotten more than I uh, will ever know, um, <laughs> according to this bio and, 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 and just reading up on you. Um, uh, pastor at Abyssinian at one time, taught at, I mean, at uh, Princeton, multiple different uh, seminary uh, schools uh, attended Union Theological Seminary in New York. Also has a book entitled "The Pulpit and Politics: Separation of Church and State in the Black Church." So, thank you, Dr. McMichael. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. So, I'm excited, in particularly, about this conversation as one who has been, um, I guess you could say, betwixt between how to view uh, his particular role in the political landscape. So, mm -hmm. um, as one who finds the Bible as its as his final authority, I want to start off by asking a question. What can we discern from the scriptures that ought to guide the believer in this democratic process? And we'd like to um, pass that to you first, McMichael. How are you informed by the scriptures and how do you encourage believers in how to engage the political landscape as mm -hmm. uh, within the political landscape as the scriptures would advise us? Sure. Uh, I'm going to address that sort of from two or three different angles. Right. One, 34 years as a pastor, so I had sort of the pastoral responsibility of trying to get people to think about public policy issues. Um, now as a professor and a seminary president, um, kind of stepped back a little bit from the front lines, but I'm still writing about it. But in every turn, I've taken Matthew 25, 31 to 44 as my operating point of departure. Uh, if Jesus is calling us to be responsive to the issues of hunger and uh, those who are sick, those who are strangers among us, those who are imprisoned and wants us to respond to them even to the level of the least of these, then the question becomes how do we operationally respond? Mm -hmm. uh, it's one thing to say I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was sick, I was a stranger, I was in prison. The question is in what ways can we respond to that? And one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways by which we can respond to that mandate is through the use of the political process, through public policy activities that allow for the needs of the hungry, the imprisoned, the sick, uh, the thirsty, the naked to be addressed. So I think that what the Lord gives us is a calling to respond to a certain part of uh, the work of the reign of God on earth and what political activity does is gives us a platform or mechanism by which mm -hmm. those needs can be addressed. And so I think I belong to that school of thought that says uh, there are a variety of ways to respond, but the political process, not so much the bickering and the arguing and the fussing, 
yeah. but uh, the use of public policy and revenue to address human suffering and human need uh, is a good way to start. Absolutely. Dr. Bacow. Uh I, I just sort of uh, piggyback on that. Thank, thank, that's a great answer. I love that. Um, for me, uh, the, the way that uh, the question sort of raised for me comes from dealing with those that are more reticent about thinking about whether we should be involved because of fear of public engagement being too worldly. So, so I, I've kind of had to think about it in terms of how are people having permission to mm. participate in public life. And I, I, I get that by really actually going back to what I, I call uh, the, I'm, I'm not the only person who's used this language, but what I call the first great commission on the first page of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when humans are given this mandate to be stewards of the creation, to rule over the creation, part of that ruling over the creation includes how we're going to manage our life together. That management of our life together has to include political engagement. And uh, and then to uh, overcome the skepticism or re resistance of those who say, well, the third page of the Bible, you know, it says that there's a fall and therefore we're in this problematic circumstance. And even with Christ coming, it's still problematic. He's sort of rescuing us out of that rather than orienting us into it. In fact, it's as if th what what uh, is in Matthew 25 is something that the church may do in terms of its ministries as church, but somehow uh, there's a fear that if you're involved in the political process that you're too sucked into temptations of power, etc. Whereas I would argue that Matthew 25 is giving us one uh, you know, particular uh, catalyst for seeing why it's absolutely necessary for us to see a, a multiplicity of ways to be obeying that first great commission and participating in, in the public realm. And you mentioned in a democratic society. So we're in a society where as citizens, we actually can be people who participate in the political process. We're not North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not Saudi Arabia, right? I mean, we, we, we are in a uh, flawed but still uh, democratic republic that at least on paper says that citizens ought to be involved in helping to influence public policy, raising questions to representatives about the public policies, asking for new public policies when there are particular concerns. Um, so we're in an environment, we're in a context that makes it possible for us to be participants in, in a really engaged way. So to me, th the context itself uh, provides us with uh, a, a platform for obeying that first great commission and one expression of it being uh, political. Absolutely. So being that people have responded and we've seen in the news in various different ways, um, whether it be protests or uh, people who strategically place themselves in ways or in places to um, change policy, how do you as a professor or Dr. McMickle as a, as a pastor and as a professor as well, how do you encourage or um, equip your congregation on how to address some of their uh, political frustrations or um, or our passions and where do you feel like there's a potential for the Christian to go too far um, within um, exercising uh, some of their their frustration within the political landscape yeah well I would begin um, and I, I appreciate very much the the reference to the first great commission that's a, that's a that's a wonderful go, point of departure um, uh, I would say yeah. that part of what African American churches have to do is remember that there's a very long history of African American churches and okay, clergy. I, I'll go. I, I don't hear Dr. McMichael answer. Oh, he's he's speaking right now. Oh, are is you, he? Yeah. Are you not? Oh, okay. No, he's 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 speaking. <laughs> okay. All yeah. Right. I'll let you. Um, should I keep going? Can you not hear him? Is the question. Nope. No, he cannot hear. Hold a second. Let's see. Um, can you speak, Dr. McMichael, for him just to see yeah. if you... Yeah, uh, I just... Uh, well, I'll keep answering yeah, for those go ahead. who are and I'll, and, connected. And go ahead. We'll work it out. Yeah, so uh, part of what I'm arguing in the book that I wrote, Pulpit and Politics, is that ever since the Reconstruction era, 
Mm -hmm. uh, African American clergy and churches have used, among other tools, the political process, seeking office, working through state legislatures, trying to adopt policies that don't affect people one by one, mm -hmm. but that with a single vote, with a single action, you could impact the lives, you know, of tens of thousands of people. Uh, in terms of housing, in terms of wage control, in terms of access to um, public accommodations and so forth. So I think, you know, there's a history of churches being involved, but a legitimate fear that the process can be corrupting, mm. that you end up making compromises that you don't want to make. So I think there is a legitimate concern about that. But the more you know about how the process works, the more you know what issues are at stake and the more you know about why you're doing this, mm -hmm. uh, the less vulnerable you are to being corrupted because you've got your own agenda. And, uh, you know, you're not trying to get power for power's sake, but using power for the sake of the uplift of the disadvantaged in society. So I think if pastors and churches have candidate forums, if pastors and churches have opportunities to be conversant on public policy issues, uh, for instance, let's just take Flint, Michigan. Okay. Um, whatever's going to happen in Flint, it's going to be a political decision. Right. Whatever money is allocated will be a political decision. Whoever is uh, removed from office is going to be a political decision. Whatever pipes get replaced is going to be a political decision. Better that people in Flint understand how that's going to work and why it failed the first time around than to back away from it because they're afraid of being corrupted and let somebody else, like you know, the governor of Michigan, uh, resolve all of this. Well, we saw what happened when folks who don't have a righteous agenda take over. They, you know, they, cut, they cut programs and cut costs, and it impacts the very folk that we're trying to help. Absolutely. Dr. Baco, were you able to hear any of that? Nope. <laughs> but my right. re re response is I can hear him. I can hear him. So, All right. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ask the question. Um, yeah, sure. Um, That's cool. Um, uh, how do you, um, mm -hmm. I guess, engage your students yeah. in, in in being able to be effective within the political landscape by them, whether it be by protests or by yeah. uh, political engagement by a. Uh, uh, influence and policy decisions, but then also specifically to you, um, mm -hmm. in your in your the in your theology, as some may challenge you as being a um, uh, a transformationalist, I guess you can say. Yeah, right. Uh, yep. How do you guard against uh, totalitarianism? Yes, exactly. How do you guard <laughs> against that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll take the last question first. <laughs> so, uh, I always like to talk about uh, transformation without triumphalism. Mm -hmm. So. If you always recognize that we see through a glass darkly, that all of our public policy approaches are going to have sort of a label on them that says subject to revision, mm. because none of us sees clearly enough to say uh, this approach, this answer is the final answer. This is the answer that's a one size fits all answer. Then we'll have a proper humility in our engagement. So as long as we have it properly uh, bridled by humility, then I think we should be okay. I, I certainly acknowledge the fact that there are people who can be a little too enamored of their own sort of ideas about things. And they're so enamored of their ideas that um, they're not recognizing that e even if you put their idea into practice, that their idea probably still has dimensions of it that probably need to be revised or that aren't certainly the fullness of the realization of the kingdom of God. So. So as long as you can have a, a transformationalism that's that's bridled by humility, I think we're okay mm -hmm. on that. Um, and I, I do think that what we're doing with our various actions in the public square, we're giving what I like to call signposts of the kingdom mm -hmm. without confusing those signposts with uh, establishing the end result of the kingdom itself. Because, I mean, Christ will, will make that happen. But Christ making that happen doesn't then mean that there, you know, there's a now and a not yet, right? So right. I don't ignore the now because there's a not yet, um, but because I'm between the now and the not yet, I know that we're going somewhere, and the the various things that we do are certainly saying, look, at least this is the trajectory 
where we're going, or it's something like this. Without, while also recognizing that because we don't see so clearly, then um, you know th there might be parts of it that are good, and some parts that I've said, that we might have thought were good, but discover that there's something better. Right. So uh, I think as long as we're doing that, that, that I think we're okay. But I don't think the problem is people thinking too much about being triumphalistic. I think right now we're dealing with the problem of cynicism, hmm. of, of of people wondering whether it's worthwhile to even try, uh, or, or or they're or they're despairing of, of of progress. To which I would say we have to ask ourselves the question of expectations. Uh, I mean, how long do we think? Uh, how long do we think it takes for changes to happen? Sometimes changes may happen quickly. Sometimes it takes a longer time for changes to happen. So uh, we, we have to recognize that sometimes, you know, we're involved in a very long, slow, at times perhaps tedious process. And sometimes that tedious process requires things like writing to your representatives or even going to see your representatives. Um, but that, that, that other times, uh, it, it, for some people, it may involve protesting. I mean, I don't think there's just one, sort of a one-size-fits-all political right. action approach. Um, some people, you know, they're born protesters, activists. We need them to do what they do and to do with wisdom and, and, and maturity and, and, and strategically. Um, and there are other people, they're probably better writing letters. Yeah. So, so it's okay to have uh, both people. But both sets of people should vote. Absolutely. Uh, and Amen. Uh, Amen. sometimes Amen. people are fearful about, does my vote matter? Well, if enough people voted, I think we would see that it matters. So um, I, I, I want to encourage people to vote and to not let um, the frustrations about the imperfections of the political process be reasons to then check out of the political process. So, so I think we definitely ought to be involved in that. But then also people should be involved in uh, you're involved in political life, not just necessarily by being specifically involved in things related to talking to your representative or writing to your representative or, or protesting about particular things, but also by participating in just regular community life. I mean, what attention do people pay to things like public education or to various community-related types of things that might help build the community, where, where, where you relate to people and you talk to people about their lives, you ask you, you find out how other people are doing in terms of their education or their employment status, et cetera, and you're attending to those things. And, and of course, certainly the business world itself is also a context where people should be participating. And uh, there are things that people are doing in the business world, and, think, and I would argue ways we need to innovate the business world that are really important for addressing some of the big political concerns that people have right now. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. McMichael, you mentioned the Reconstruction, and as we look through history, especially with an African-American context, mm -hmm. we see that um, there have been great men and women who were both Christians, uh, pastors, but also very political, mm -hmm. from uh, the Absalom Joneses and Richard Allens to Frederick Douglasses. But it seems as if today there's a little tension, as you yourself experienced in Ohio, where, there, where people find that pastors should probably divorce themselves from uh, being too politically engaged for not only just for those who are listening who may be pastors who have that that desire to uh, engage in political office but anybody who's probably a naysayer what do you um, say to those individuals that want you to keep your 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 political <coughs> views and your biblical views separate on Sunday morning sure 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 well um, two or three things one when the Constitution was being drafted uh, two of the great voices that were involved at the time were James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. And uh, Jefferson began his reflections on this by suggesting that clergy should not be involved because, of course, they were afraid of the return of a state-sanctioned church. Mm -hmm. James Madison's retort to him was that you cannot treat clergy as if they are somehow denied some of the rights and privileges that accrue to every other citizen. Now, you want to make sure that the clergy are not using their platform to support a particular candidate. So, you know, you can't turn the pulpit into, uh, into a campaign rally for X person. But I don't think that the clergy should be robbed of the right to have political views or even seek political office uh, if they are inclined to do so with certain um, restrictions. One of the great stories of, of uh, 
sort of an African-American history, and you came close to that name, is Hiram Revels. Oh. Hiram Revels was an AME elder after the Civil War, and um, he was appointed by the Mississippi State Legislature to the United States Senate. He was the first African-American U.S. Senator, an AME preacher, and the seat that he filled was the seat that was vacated by Jefferson Davis when Mississippi seceded from the Union. So the first black senator in the country's history took the seat from the president of the Confederate States of America. That's a and served with great distinction in that seat. He was then followed in terms of notoriety by Henry McNeil Turner, another famous African Methodist Episcopal preacher who was elected to the Georgia State Legislature in the 1860s and 70s. Uh, so there's a long history of African-American clergy who were uh, active in the church and active in the political process and who walked the tightrope. That's been going on for a hundred years. Floyd Flake, Bill Gray, Andrew Young, Walter Fauntroy, of course in my case at Abyssinian, Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now this is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Baycoat said, you need all kinds. So I don't call on all preachers to do this. But if they have an inclination to do it, they should not let any fear about the separation of church and state become a conflict for them. And so long as they're doing it with the public good in mind, and they're not uh, violating any IRS laws in terms of endorsing particular candidates, those who are inclined to do so should, and uh, their churches need to allow them to exercise whatever gifting they may have to function within that arena. But if you don't like the campaign, if you don't like public policy discussions, if you don't really like people, you know, if you don't want to go out and shake hands, then don't do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you really want to be engaged at sort of the uh, highest level of policy discussion and you want to impact people with one vote that can accomplish in one vote what it might take 25 trips to City Hall to do as just a private citizen, this is a this is a very useful thing to be involved in. Absolutely, Dr. Baker, were you able to hear him at all? No. Are we still uh, we're still struggling? Be really, really sad because <laughs> I just, I'm watching your reactions. I'm like. Yeah, he he gave I, a history I'm, lesson. I'm gonna have to watch the episode. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, he gave a history lesson, and uh, yeah. and uh, it was great. So, I right, this next question, I wish I can reiterate what he said, but yeah. I wouldn't do it justice. So. Yeah. Um, this will have to be my last question, unfortunately. Oh, well, this, well, this will be hopefully a good question. Um, I'm sure they're all be good. <laughs> somewhat selfish of myself. Uh, I have uh, cool. my, many of my friends and compadres, we find ourselves walking a tightrope of conservatism and progressivism. <laughs> and <laughs> as African-American men and women, we feel like there are certain values that we believe we hold tight to that conservatives uh, preach and pander to, I, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. But there's also a sense of uh, justice and uh, social welfare that we right. see the progressives hold on to. And so, therefore, I am torn, I am betwixt between yeah. these two parties, and I, and I am somewhat like, as Malcolm X said, uh, or I don't want to become a political chump, as he said in the Ballad of the Bullet, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just giving my vote away to a party yeah. just because my mom and my grandparents did that. Right, right. How do you encourage uh, African, urban African Americans who find themselves torn between mm -hmm. these? They're not necessarily moderates. They're just they they know where they are. Yeah, sure. They agree left and they agree right, but they just right. can't find a home with any particular party. Uh, well, first a. I empathize, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so because I've lived this as well. But what I would say is, first, don't check out. Uh, two, um, especially in national elections, who says you have to only vote for one party? Because, I, I mean, you, there's a lot of different people to vote for. You're not just voting for president or for your senators or representatives. There's lots of people that you're voting for. Mm -hmm. A second thing I would say is, whichever party you're dealing with, you will be disappointed. I don't care what your commitments are, your those parties will disappoint you because there are things that people do in those parties where there are values you will share, and then there are things where 
people will do things that even if they share those values, they'll do they'll show other concerns that that, that bother you. Again, it's that question of expectation I was saying early. If we reduce our expectations so that we don't have messianic or eschatological expectations in political parties, and we recognize them as ways that people have come together in these two major political parties, we don't have a legitimate third party yet. Uh, I mean, there are lots of other little parties, but not a, a, a third party that could really contend with, with either Democrats or Republicans. Um, until such a party emerges, uh, and if that party was this middle of the logic we're looking for, until then, uh, then there, there's basically two options. One, um, if you live in a state that doesn't allow you doing primaries to uh, right. vote without deciding, right? Mm -hmm. In Illinois, where I live, you have to decide one way or another. Right. I'm an independent. Primaries are rough. Uh, so, uh, so that so you you have, you have to recognize that you you, have to, you make a choice during the primaries, but also recognize that choice doesn't lock you into whatever you're doing in the national the, the next stage of election. Uh, then I would say, um, you know, either party would benefit from having it, right? So uh, the question is, is in what way would your benefits work out? How would you be a benefit to either party? Rec while recognizing that, hey, I'm a benefit to this party, but I'm also aware that, um, you know, whether it's Republicans or whether it's Democrats, they, there are issues that they have that just aren't going to do the trick for me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there was an article that just came out, and I think it was on Politico, about a lady who's African American who'd been a Republican for years. And she was talking about the fact that, um, you know, she, the reason she became a Republican was because of Jack Kemp. Jack Jack Kemp is sort of like you know compassionate conservative. He did care about minorities, etc. Mm -hmm. But she said her experience in the party was that nobody was really serious about minorities and really about minorities and women really having uh, influence in the party. So she was very disappointed about that. Now there's still there are other African Americans. They still because of commitments around perhaps abortion and and, and say marriage and certain other things. They're still going to vote Republican and and house themselves there. More African Americans uh, are Democrats, but we need to remember when it comes to them being Democrats, it's not as if they've always been Democrats. This is a post 1964-65 right. reality, uh, and uh, and even the Democrats uh, have taken African Americans for granted, just like Absolutely. Republicans take evan white evangelicals for granted. Right? It's like, oh, I got your votes. I don't really need to. I, I can give you lip service and never do anything because that that certainly happened a lot for I think white evangelicals who sided with Republicans. So, you know, reckon with the fact that um, parties will deliver some things, but they, they can never deliver all things. Yeah. So, so then you have to decide, um, perhaps at this time, who do you think is addressing the issues of greatest concern? And who is helping to provide pathways to addressing these issues of greatest concern? Sometimes you might, you might think, well, some of these Republicans have good ideas. Other times you might think these Democrats have good ideas. Um, while also recognizing that, I mean, you can find people in every party that will make you say, I'm not hanging out with these people. All right? So, so, so part of what I'm saying is, yes, it's hard. Uh, <laughs> but that you, 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 perhaps the best thing to do right now is case by case. Yeah. You know? Uh, but also become informed about the various uh, candidates where you are, and and you may, and you may find yourself voting for different kinds of people because, um, you know, uh, the label Democrat or Republican doesn't always mean that people are going to have the positions you think they have or make the, um, or make or make the decisions you you, you think they will. Yeah. So, so, so it's really complicated, but in a, in a country like ours where political participation is a possibility, then at the very least, vote is what I would say. Absolutely. At the very least, vote. And then also, I would just say, um, yes, um, it's okay to be exasperated and frustrated about this some of the time. But, but it shouldn't be surprising that it's exasperating and frustrating because we're between the now and the not yet. There, there, there are things that will happen in political life, no matter which where you're hanging your hat, where you want to say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, right? And then there are other times where you say, wow, that's something 
positive that happened here. So, for example, it's actually a bipartisan, bipartisan commitments to attending to issues of mass incarceration. That's a pleasant surprise uh, that, that that's happened. So, um, you know, uh, th th there are sometimes better things there than uh, the things that may make you want to bang your head against a wall every now and then, right? So, uh, so yeah. tempered expectations, but tempered expectations, uh, but also a commitment to stay in the game. I think it's very important to stay in the game. And then the last thing I'll say is this. If you check out of the game, then you are also making really a commitment to say, uh, I have decided to abdicate my responsibility. Uh -huh. and, there's no, and, and, and there's nothing for me to complain about because yeah. I checked out. I said to somebody else, you do it. Yeah. Which means don't if, if you abdicate, don't complain. Absolutely. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's different than complaining if you're in North Korea. <laughs> right? <True>. North Korea, <laughs> I mean, this is a totalitarian yeah. regime, right? True. True. Uh, and very unpredictable totalitarian regime. Um, we're not in that type of situation. So I, I, so I would say um, participate in this imperfect society. And you, you might find yourself migrating here and there. Yeah. Uh, and that that migration isn't necessarily a problem. But 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 be informed and try to do your part for uh, being committed, flourishing of others, and making your choices about who seems to be dealing with the things that are most important right now. Dr. Bako, thank you for joining us. I know you have to leave early. Um, yes. It's been a pleasure, and we're going to. Yeah. We're gonna. Uh, is there anything that you would like to promote before you uh, you leave this? Oh, you know what? This is so funny. <laughs> I just happen to have behind me <laughs> this book. Oh, which is wow. actually backwards, right on that screen there. But that's my book. Uh, you know, so that's kind of funny. The Political Disciple: Theology of Public Life, less than 100 pages, so people can read that. Oh, wow. Nobody believes me when I say you can read it in less than 90 minutes, but I think you can. Um, and uh, it, you know, but I, the, the book is is hopefully trying to help people to think about being engaged in our society in a way that I think is more authentically Christian uh, and authentically Christian in a way that makes Christians seen as people who actually care about society and care about all persons, not just the people that agree with them and people right. who stay in the game even when the game is disappointing. In, in, in short terms, how to be a totalitarian, basically. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, you guys definitely go check that book out. We're going to continue the conversation with, with uh, Dr. McMickle. And um, Bye. you have a good one. Um, so, Bye. Doctor, so, Dr. Yes, McMickle, the question that was stated to uh, Dr. Bako, um, how do you encourage the, uh, the young African-American or the middle, the, not the younger, just the, uh, the African-American male or female in general who is torn between these parties and feel like there is not a voice that speaks for them. Um, and, and oftentimes they feel like they're pimped out for primaries and for national votes while being left behind and forgotten once that individual is in office. Yeah, I, this is a legitimate concern, and it, it, it has never not been the case. Um, mm. Every generation is of the impression that something that's happening to them for the first time. <laughs> gotcha. uh, in point of fact, every generation has been frustrated by the process of the political realm. People thought when President Kennedy was elected because of the overwhelming African-American support that he received, which, by the way, he received after he intervened right. uh, in the arrest of Martin Luther King Jr. and probably saved him from being killed in a Georgia prison. And uh, Daddy King went to the National Baptist Convention and endorsed John F. Kennedy, and uh, that pretty much swung the election mm -hmm. for Kennedy over Nixon. Uh, they thought that he'd be a great civil rights president. Well, he wasn't. He was very slow to respond. In some respects, Lyndon Baines Johnson was a much better civil right. rights president, but he was, you know, he was from Texas. So who would have thought that it would work out that way? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you have to have limited hope that anything is going to turn around on a dime. But here's the flip side. If you don't 
vote. If you're not involved, somebody's going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. If you're not engaged and other folks are, somebody's going to win. Yeah. And if you don't vote for them, if you're not engaged, then you have no point of reference to uh, criticize. You can't support. You can't write. This is the problem in Flint. Richard Snyder, governor of Michigan, mm -hmm. knew yeah. that Flint was an overwhelmingly democratic town, working class town. They didn't vote for him. He felt no allegiance to them. He just ignored them. Mm. And look at what happened uh, in Flint. So I think we cannot afford to not be engaged. Um, vote for who you want to. And as Dr. Baycoat said, vote the whole ticket. Vote for the president. Vote for the judges. Vote Absolutely. for the state legislature. Vote for the school board. Mm. There are lots of levels of government, and we ought to be involved in all of them. But I would add one more thing. You've got to vote with with something in mind about what is your core value. Mm, okay. Paul says, you know, I don't want you to be blown about by every wind in doctrine. You know, every time the wind changes, you change your mind. So what is it that is central to you that helps you then sort out which person or which party? It could be a democratic value. All people are created equal. Mm -hmm. It could be the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. Uh, it could be a biblical mandate. All people are made in the image of God. So the question becomes, who is the person or what is the party that most closely resembles a value system that puts worth and value on every single human life? And what are the parties that are building walls and that are trying to ban folk from the country and that are trying to devalue certain, certain parts of the population? And you vote accordingly, you know. Um, so I would say it's important to not just know the not just know the candidate, but have a core position, you know, right. a, a north star. And then you can hear somebody and say, "Well, that's not you know that's not part of my core agenda." So I'm going to just go the other way. Right. Uh, so I think a, an uneducated voter is not simply one who doesn't know the candidates; it's one who doesn't know himself, doesn't know herself, doesn't know what they believe. And therefore, they can get blown. You know, right. well, so and so sounds good, so I'll go. I'll go that way. Yeah. So I, I try to not only know the values of the candidate, but my own values. Absolutely. So you uh, sub subversively mentioned uh, a particular individual and <laughs> <laughs> building walls. How do you? Um, many social scientists or political scientists, better yet, have been trying to figure out the phenomenon that is uh, the front runner right now on the Republican side, and mm -hmm. many people are still confused. Um, you being an evangelical, which shouldn't be, it, it, it's something it shouldn't be, but you being an evangelical and uh, an outspoken evangelical who is also engaged in politics, how do you um, explain, is it, is it, is it mere uh, illusion that there is a mass group of evangelicals who are supporting um, the front runner, or is this uh, people who are, some would say, compromising their core values um, to a degree, or is it just cultural leanings? How would you explain <coughs> to someone who is trying to wrap their mind around the phenomenon of, of, of Donald Trump and the evangelical vote and his influence in the primaries right now? Um, I think that this is as much a demographic issue as it is uh, a theological issue. I think Donald Trump is resonating with people who see that the notion of America as a white majority society is going to be uh, eclipsed in 20 or 30 years. Yeah. That uh, the idea of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant country is being erased by population shifts. Mm -hmm. And so if you have been nurtured on the idea that the country should look a certain way, that our leaders should look a certain way, that there ought to be a certain group that's in charge of everything, and suddenly you've got an African-American president, you've got a stunning diversity on the Supreme Court, uh, you've got uh, people in the U.S. Senate and the Congress that you're not accustomed to seeing in those roles. Um, 
this is a this is a last gasp for people who are afraid of the change that is inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so Donald Trump, I think, has resonated with people who are afraid. Um, they are afraid of immigration. They are in fr they are afraid of religious diversity. How can you have uh, a Christian nation if you've got a steadily growing Muslim presence uh, that corresponds to a steadily growing Jewish presence yeah. that corresponds to a steadily growing agnostic, atheistic, you know, none of the above presence? The world is evolving faster than some people feel comfortable with. So how do you put the brakes on it? Well, you can't. Yeah. All you can do is uh, give those who are frustrated and angry one last time to vent. I recall Martin Luther King saying, the days of segregation are over. The only thing that is left is how costly segregationists will make the funeral. Mm. Uh, it's going to die. Mm. The question is, at what future cost? America is evolving. The demographic signs are with us. Nothing is going to reverse this trend. Um, for some people, it is a welcome thing. You know, the, the, the country will look like the world. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to have to adjust to that in some ways. And uh, I think that Donald Trump speaks to a certain nativistic, xenophobic, you know, right. we are exceptional, we are better than everybody else in the world. Um, so if I could, if I could ask you to to give us a prophetic voice, and what does this, what does all this mean, not just for the Republican Party, but for, um, but for people who don't fall in line, who 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 who, because there's obviously those who have influential roles within the RNC who do not vouch for Trump and who find themselves in a very interesting place. Um, do you find that this is going to change the the way that the the, the, the Republican Party looks, kind of like after the Goldwater years, going into uh, uh, the the Reagan years and whatnot, or is this just kind of like business as usual? Will this even change the way that the Democratic Democratic Party looks in some senses, as we see a Democratic Socialist and how people are finding themselves enamored by him? Um, yeah. How do, how does this change the the political landscape going forward going forward as it as it pertains to parties? Yeah, I think I think the thing that both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have in common is that they are theoretically um, outsiders in the sense of the way in which they're going about their campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the front runner. She's supposed to run away with this thing. There really wasn't supposed to be a primary right. uh, for the Democratic <laughs> Party. And then he showed up and, uh, you know, with a whole different set of issues and has theoretically pushed her conversation to a more left-wing progressive set of issues, which she would not have discussed if he was not around. Mm -hmm. uh, what Donald Trump has done is that he has sort of jumped in and, and pushed aside all of the, all of the sort of front-runner assumptions Jeb Bush was supposed to be in this race. Marco Rubio was supposed to be in this race. Uh, John Kasich, you know, as a governor, he's pushed all of them out because people are frustrated mm -hmm. with the political process and with what they have gotten for their investment. And so they're prepared to try something new and different. The question is, can either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump actually do all of the outlandish things that they are proposing they would do if elected? Right. Can you provide free higher education for everybody? Can you guarantee a $15 minimum wage? Can you build a wall that's 3,000 miles long? Can you round up 12 million people and get them out of the country? Can you ban all Muslims from coming in? You know, these are great campaign statements. They are very improbable uh, in terms of their practical application. So I think people have to be cautious about folks who overpromise, yes, because it sounds good, yes. and then when time comes to do it, you can't do all of these things as easily as they make it sound. True. So I think it's gonna, you know, we'll we'll come right back to political reality. How do you move forward incrementally toward the country that you're trying to shape with the players that are available? 
And as uh, Dr. Baycoat said, recognize that if you're looking for the political world to introduce the kingdom of God, that is a very unlikely scenario. So last question. Um, as we recognize that the uh, that there's a, there are very polarizing views um, philosophically out there on the political landscape, for those who believe that there are systems of injustice that keep particular people oppressed um, and they voice those opinions, usually those thoughts are met with labeling as calling folks Marxist or socialist, um, talking about uh, calling, uh, there's, a new, there's a term that seems to be floating around called racial Gnosticism. For you, <laughs> in, 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 in addressing these issues from a Christian perspective, when, when someone calls you, like how do you guard against or how do you even handle uh, the, the naysayers or the labeling coming from particular people who feel like you're race baiting or you're, uh, you're a race whiner or may label you a Marxist because you believe that there are systems of justice that have, uh, systems of, of injustice that have been created and still operate <laughs> today and function fairly well. Yeah. Um, while I'm delighted to discuss this book with you, I want to talk just for a minute about a book that's coming out later this year. Absolutely. Based on Acts 1, verses 6 through 8. Mm. <clears throat> uh, the book is entitled, Be My Witness, mm. The Great Commission for Preachers. And it says, Jesus says to the disciples, Be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that Jesus is intentionally sending the disciples into ever wider spheres. Mm -hmm. Don't just stay in your city. Go to your region, Samaria. Don't just stay in your region with people that you don't like, but go to your nation, Judea. And if God is a global God, if God is sovereign over the whole of creation, then wherever God has an interest, the church ought to have an interest. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, to the end of the earth. The critical piece is this word, be my witness. So I have three thoughts about that, and it speaks to your point. First one is that a witness is someone who sees what's going on. You're paying attention to everything you just said. Mm. There are forms of injustice. There are forms of uh, oppression. There are forms of social policy that are cruel and crude, and you see it. Yeah. The second thing that a witness does is that he or she promises to say the truth about what they have seen. Hmm. This is where the numbers get smaller. A lot of folks see things, but they're afraid mm -hmm. to say. Come on. So they keep their testimony to themselves. Jesus is calling us to not just see something, but to say something about what we have seen, which then comes to the third point. And the Greek word for witness in the New Testament is martyria, M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A, which is the basis for the English word martyr. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus is saying is, be prepared to see something, to say something about what you've seen, and then be prepared to suffer something for what you have said. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be called a name, at least be called a name for saying something about what is right. Come on. If they're going to attack you by labeling you, at least give them a good reason for doing it. And don't be afraid of being attacked. Don't be afraid of being criticized. If in the process of introducing the kingdom of God, you are afraid of being criticized, you ought to stop now. Uh, if you're afraid of being labeled, then just, you know, this, go live in a hole somewhere, you know, and, and curl up in a ball. The devil is not going to surrender without a fight. And uh, the kingdom is not going to roll in uh, on its own. Somebody has to push it. Somebody has to aid it. Somebody has to birth it, you know. And uh, prophets are not people who keep their opinions to themselves. Yep. Uh, Jeremiah, Micah, Isaiah, Hosea, this whole litany of people, Amos, all of them saw something, said something, and were prepared to suffer for something. This sounds like John the Baptist, sounds like Jesus, sounds like Peter, sounds like Paul, and all of the church leaders of the last 2,000 years who, in the process of being faithful witnesses, suffered the label. So what? So in the end, the only label I want comes from God. 
which Amen. is faithful. You know, be Come faithful. On. And uh, if the world doesn't like me, but the Lord does, I'm satisfied. That was a perfect ending right there, being faithful. Amen. So thank you, Dr. McMichael, for joining us thank on you. the June 3 Project. It's been a wonderful discussion. Is there a book? Uh, would you like to tell us the name of that well, book? I just, that's coming? <laughs> I just happen to have this book here, too. <laughs> uh, we, we keep our books pretty close, don't we? we so go. this one is we called uh, Pulpit and Politics. Separation of church and state in the black church, and the argument here is that black clergy should be politically engaged. There's a history of that engagement, and they should not be dissuaded by the fear that their involvement is a violation of the separation of church and state. It is not. That policy is designed to keep the government out of the church, not necessarily to keep the church from any engagement with public life. So I hope folk will read it. Uh, it's not 90 pages, it's a little longer than that, but uh, it's, I think, a good introduction to this discussion. Thank you so much. We appreciate the conversation. Um, blessings and, and grace to you and all that you're doing. And uh, we, we hope and pray that the book does well and your future book does well as well. Thank you so much. Enjoyed being with you. Yeah. Okay. Are we done?